Now, I first tried out Android when I tried out the HTC Dream Phone, which was the first commercial device that launched with Android now more than 10 years ago. At launch, Android was known for its trans transparency and openness, and we still stand by these principles today. And since then, Android has made its way into the hands of billions of consumers in some of the most demanding enterprise environments. And in order to protect all of our users and their data, security is a top priority. And we're, we're making immeasurable progress and raising the bar across the mobile ecosystem. We run a vulnerability rewards program, uh, which is a bounty program with some of the highest payouts in the industry, paying up to $200,000 for a, a security exploit chain that compromises your device. High rewards plus our open source code fosters a vibrant community of researchers who help us find bugs before they affect our users. And in 2018, there were zero critical security vulnerabilities affecting the Android platform that were publicly disclosed without a security update or mitigation available. As another data point, there are a number of vulnerability discovery and disclosure competitions that invite hackers from around the world to come and break mobile devices and paid up to hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so. At Mobile Phone I Own, which is one of the most well-known competitions of this kind, Google Pixel has a great track record of being unbroken year after year. Now, we know that these results were achieved on fully patched, up-to-date devices, and that the ability to patch a device is critical to its security posture. And we're doing a lot to increase patch rates across the ecosystem. At the technical level, we've re-architected the operating system to make patching easy for device makers and seamless for users, to make updates easy for device makers and seamless for users. And beyond the technical level, our ecosystem of partners have come together to form a strong collaboration to remove barriers. And in Q4 of 2018, we saw 84% more devices receive a security update compared to Q4 of the prior year. Now, we know that security threats come in many forms. And some of them, like phishing and spyware, don't need to actually compromise your device and bypass the security model in order to harm users. So Android devices with Google services have Google Play Protect built in and enabled by default. We leverage a combination of human security expertise and state-of-the-art machine learning to, to find potentially harmful apps before they find our users. And in 2018, we saw a 20% year-over-year decline in the proportion of devices that installed a potentially harmful app. All of this data, plus a lot more, is available in our annual year in review report. We also publish a quarterly transparency report with details on the overall health of the ecosystem. To find links to these reports, along with a lot more information, visit the Android Security Center website at android.com slash security. OK, so that was a quick overview of how we're doing today. Now, developers in the audience and everyone else in the audience probably came here to learn more about what's new in Android Q. And there were a lot of changes. They fall under three categories. Privacy, updatability, and hardening. Now, privacy is a huge focus area for us and has been for many years. We made dozens of changes across all aspects of the operating system. We're giving users a lot more transparency over access to their data. We're giving users more control over their location. And we're further restricting app access to persistent device identifiers. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There was a talk yesterday at I.O. focused on privacy for Android. So take a look at the recording for that to learn more. Next, updatability. We're building upon the momentum that we started with, and with Project Treble a couple of years ago. And this year, we launched Project Mainline. With Project Mainline, a few system, uh, system components, including some security critical ones, will now be updated directly by Google. So for example, the media frameworks, which accounted for about 40% of the bugs that were uh, patched in last year's monthly security bulletin, will now be updated by Google on all new devices that launch with Android Q. And device makers can also to choose to have Conscript, which is Android's TLS provider, also updated directly by Google. 
With this in place, future bugs affecting these components can now be fixed much more quickly across the entire ecosystem, so we don't leave our users vulnerable. To learn more about this, we published a blog post yesterday on the Android developers blog. So take a look at that uh, to find out more. And finally, hardening. Android leverages, uh, Android leads the ecosystem in leveraging compiler level mitigations such as sanitizers, control flow integrity, and hardware ASAN, and many more to harden the operating system. In Android Q, we expanded the usage of these techniques in the kernel as well as the most critical parts of the user space to significantly reduce the potential exploitability of bugs in these areas. Now, these hardening tools can also be leveraged by apps. For example, for apps that target the Android Q API level, you'll now have execute-only memory enabled by default. This marks, marks memory regions, executable memory, memory regions, as not readable, which strengthens ASLR, address space layout randomization. To learn more about hardening, we have a blog post coming out in the next couple of days to the Android developers blog. OK. So that was a quick overview of how the operating system is becoming even more secure with Android Q. Now, the developers in the audience probably came here to learn more about what we can do to make our apps more secure. So we're building upon, um, so last year we launched industry-leading APIs such as Strongbox and Protected Confirmation. And this year, we're building upon, upon that momentum. So for the remainder of this session, we'll cover a few topics um, in encryption, in application signing keys, and in user authentication. We'll also cover a couple of really exciting areas, a couple of really big areas that we're working on uh, that promise to be very impactful in the future. OK, let's now dive into the first topic, encryption. This is an area where we've gotten a lot of questions from developers over the years. Developers want to know, is my data actually encrypted on the device? Now, the answer has always been fairly complicated. While the vast majority of new Android devices fully encrypt user data, there are a number of low-end devices, such as Android Go devices, sold primarily in developing markets, that use low-end hardware and don't have hardware acceleration for encryption. And so encryption on those devices causes noticeable slowdowns and makes the device hard to use. And this affects not just phones and not just Android devices. Smart watches, Internet of Things appliances, and similar smart connected devices often reuse the same hardware as in phones, and so they inherit the same hardware limitations. To address this, we set out to create an encryption mode that can run fast without additional hardware. And the result is Adiantum. Adiantum is a new encryption mode created by Google engineers and cryptographers designed specifically for disk encryption on low-end ARM devices. It has a couple of very nice properties. First, Adiantum was designed to run based using only operations that all CPUs natively support. So it doesn't need additional hardware. In our benchmarks, running purely on CPUs, Adiantum runs five times as fast as AES, which is the standard cipher used on Android today. And so besides being fast, from a security perspective, Adiantum only uses well-known cryptographic primitives with well-known security properties. And because we developed it fully in the open, we got a lot of input and feedback from the worldwide community of security researchers to help us make sure that it works correctly. And so besides being fast and being secure, Adiantum now levels the playing field for all Android users. While high-end devices, Premium devices with specialized hardware will always have an edge in speed, as well as some security properties. Low-end devices now also have a tool to help them encrypt and secure their user data. So now with Android Q, 100% of compatible devices launching with Q will now encrypt user data with no exceptions. So this includes all form factors supported by Android, including the phones in your pocket, the tablets that your kids may be playing with, the Android-based TV that may be in your living room, and the Android Auto-based car that you may be driving. So this is a huge milestone for Android. And beyond Android, it's also a huge milestone for the entire community. Adiantum is fully open sourced and has been merged into Linux 5.0. And so in today's world, 
where computation is increasingly moving to the edge, um, often to low-power devices. Device makers, regardless of whether you're running, your device is, is running Android or not, now have a new tool to help secure your user data. OK, so Adiantum is great for new devices. Um, but device makers in the audience, you probably have apps that need to run on older devices as well. And so you need a solution for encryption that runs everywhere. Now, unfortunately, writing an encryption layer is far from easy, and mistakes are common. Mistakes such as reusing nonces or not having enough entropy in your key generation. And what's worse is that these mistakes often go unnoticed until an incident happens. And so this year, in order to make that easier, we have built a security library into Jetpack. Thank you. The Jetpack security library was built based on our experiences talking with developers, talking with all of you about your top pain points. And the goal here is to make common tasks, 80% of the most common tasks, really easy to get right. These tasks include encrypting files, encrypting shared preferences, and securing your API keys. And under the hood, the Jetpack security library handles all the boring details for you such as creating and managing your keys and secure hardware, and we use industry standard best practices. The Jetpack Security Library is an alpha this week, and it supports Android 6.0 and above. So if encryption is a pain point for you, take a look and give us your feedback. OK, so we've not, now talked a lot about encryption of your data at rest with Adiantum with the Jetpack Security Library. Now, what about encryption of your data in transit, your network traffic? Last year, we launched DNS over TLS, which encrypts your DNS traffic. And this year, we're improving HTTPS by enabling TLS 1.3 by default. TLS 1.3 is a new revision of the TLS standard finalized by the IETF in August of last year. It is faster because it can often complete the connection handshake in fewer round trips, making connection times up to 40% faster. It's more secure because it removes support for problematic features. And it uses a redesigned handshake that fixes several weaknesses. And finally, it is more private because it, it encrypts more than negotiation handshake to protect the identities of the participating parties. Now, how do you use TLS 1.3 in Android? For web browsing, modern browsers such as Chrome and Firefox have already enabled support. For apps, if your app uses Chrome custom tabs or WebView, then you'll also be using TLS 1.3 by default if the server supports it, regardless of the Android platform version that you're running on. And on Android, on Android Q, if your app uses Android's built-in TLS provider called Conscript, then you'll also be using TLS 1.3 by default, regardless of your app's target API level. OK, so encryption's getting better. Uh, the next question to ask is, is anyone using encryption? Are apps actually encrypting their network traffic? So we pulled some numbers. And we're really happy to see that for apps in the Play Store targeting Android Pie, more than 80% are now using network security config to block clear text network traffic. And another 5% of apps are blocking clear text by default and uh, with a few manually configured exceptions. So these are great numbers. And a big thank you to all the developers out there who are encrypting your network traffic and securing your user data. Now, if you own one of these remaining apps that's still allowing clear text by default, please take a look at your configuration and see if there's anything you can do to choose to switch to a safer default. Moving forward, we'll be adding more hints and warnings into both Android Studio as well as the Play Developer Console to help developers ensure that we're all using encryption and HTTPS as much as possible. OK, so we've talked about encryption with your encryption of your data at rest, encryption of your data in transit. Let's now switch gears and talk about application signing keys. So this is an area where we've gotten a lot of questions from developers uh, in the past as well. I've personally had meetings with a few top de developers where this is a huge pain point. The issue here is that um, there are some apps in the Play Store, especially that, uh, a few that have been in the Play Store for a long time, that are now using application signing keys that are no longer strong enough. Maybe they didn't have enough entropy when they were generated, or maybe the developer has lost access to their keys or suspect that it's been compromised. 
So in order to make key management easier, a couple of years ago, we launched App Signing by Google Play, where apps can opt in to have Google Play manage your signing keys and protect it against many types of compromise. Since launch, we've seen that a large majority of new apps are now opting in to app signing. Now, while key management is now easier, um, there remains a gap for many existing apps who are using weak keys and need a way to move to a stronger key. And so in order to help with that, this year, we're launching key upgrade for new installs by Google Play. If your app is already using uh, apps, app signing by Google Play, and if you're using a weak key, you can now ask Google Play to manage a second stronger key on your behalf. And the way that this works is that for your existing users who already have your app installed, um, all updates to that app will continue to be signed by the original key. Now, on the other hand, for your new users and returning users on devices that don't currently have your app installed, new installs will be, will be signed by the new key, and an update to that will also be signed by the new key. So this is how we can gradually move your user base to primarily using the original key to using the new key. For example, when a user uh, of yours um, buys a new phone and installs your app on that new phone. Now, you may be wondering, why are we using the new key only for new installs? Uh, the main reason here is that older Android platform versions do not have great support for key rotation. And so if we try to update your app to a new version signed by, the, uh, by a different key, the platform will reject that update. And so this approach of gradually moving your apps from using the old key to using the new key uh, is the most non-disruptive. Now, um, the good news here is that Android Pi added great support for key rotation natively into the platform. And place support is coming as well. So in the future, on new Android platform versions, we'll be able to move the new, we'll be able to move existing installs to the new key as well. Enabling this feature is very easy. First, make sure you've already opted in to app signing by Google Play. Then go to the app signing page on the Google Play developer console and click on Request key upgrade to get started. The rest of the developer workflow doesn't change. You can continue to upload a single artifact, whether it's your APK or your application bundle, and Google Play will transparently in the background sign it with either the old key or the new key and deliver the right version to the end user. OK, before you enable this, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Because you are going to be changing your application signing key you need to check for dependencies on that old signing key. For example, if you're using any third-party services that recognize your app based on the signing key, you'll probably want to update them to also recognize the new key. Also, if you're using any platform features that depend on the signing key, such as signature permissions, then you'll probably want to refactor your app to achieve your objectives in a different manner. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is a temporary limitation um, Android Pi added in great support for key rotation natively into the platform, and play support is coming as well. So in the future, you'll be able to both rotate your key as well as continue to use platform features that depend on the signing key on new platform versions. OK, so we've talked about encryption of your data at rest, encryption of your data in transit. Uh, we also talked about your application signing keys. Let's now turn to the last topic, um, user authentication. This is another area where we've gotten a lot of questions from users, from developers over the years. And it's easy to see why. There are, uh, um, there are a lot of security sensitive apps, such as banking apps, password managers, that need to prevent unauthorized access to their apps. And so they need to authenticate their users, authenticate their users on a regular basis, and we want to make that easy. So last year, in order to do this, we launched the Biometric Prompt API. Biometric Prompts. Uh, allows apps to give to use a common interface to authenticate. And so users get a consistent experience across all of their apps. And Biometric Prompt is built in a generic way to support a wide variety of biometric types, such as face, fingerprint, and iris. Since launch, we've seen a lot of apps adopt this, and we've also noticed a few gaps in coverage. And so this year, we've updated the underlying framework with more robust support for face and fingerprint, 
And we've also updated the API to support more use cases. So let's now dive in and take a look at the new features and biometric prompt in Android Q. First, biometric prompt now supports both an implicit confirmation flow as well as an explicit confirmation flow. The explicit confirmation flow is the default flow, and it's how biometric prompt works today. In the explicit flow, the user must explicitly do something to confirm the transaction, such as tap their finger to the fingerprint sensor, or if they're using face or iris, they need to press a button to confirm the transaction. The explicit flow should be used for all high-value transactions, such as payments. Now, new in biometric prompt in Android Q is our support for an implicit confirmation flow. In the implicit flow, the user doesn't actually need to do anything to confirm the transaction. Um, and this is useful if, for example, let's say you're a personal diary app, and you want to authenticate the your user. And, the user. and your user, let's say, is using face authentication. Now, when the user starts your app, you can use biometric prompt to authenticate your user using their face and transition immediately into a signed-in state without the user having to do anything. So this provides a much, um, uh, a much lighter weight, much more seamless user experience to your users. So the implicit confirmation flow is best for transactions that are easily reversible, such as sign-in and autofill. In order to select the implicit confirmation flow, call the API on your screen. And note that while the system will do its, uh, its best to honor this, there are situations where user confirmation will still be required. OK, so this is one great feature of Biometric Prompt in Android Q. Another great feature is that apps can now um, allow, give users the option of using, um, uh, of having more options to authenticate to the app. This is really useful in situations where biometric authentication may not work very well, such as face authentication in poor lighting conditions. So in those situations, apps can now give users the option to use their device pin pattern password to authenticate to the app, which can give a much better user experience in those situations. Now, of course, it may not be appropriate for all apps. And so apps can also not allow a fallback, and that is the default flow. If you don't have a fallback, you can always use your app-specific methods, such as your app-specific password, to auth authenticate your user. OK, so uh, that was the second great feature. We'll talk about one last feature for biometric prompts in Android Q. And that is, now, and that, is that apps now have the ability to check on the status of biometric authentication on the device. So this is useful if, for example, you are, you are the owner of this beautiful app on the screen. Um, you want to show this enable biometric sign-in toggle if and only if the device actually supports biometric prompts and the user has enrolled in it. So you can now check for the status of biometric authentication on that device by calling the API on the screen. All right, so that was a quick overview of what's new for biometric prompt in Android Q. Um, since we're talking about user authentication, I have two more pieces of good news. First, as of earlier this year, Android 7.0 and above is now FIDO2 certified. This means that if you are using WebAuthN on Android, if you uh, sorry, if you're using a web if if you're a website on Android, you can now use WebAuthN to authenticate your user without a password. So your users can use their lock screen, their lock screen, lock screen pin pattern password, or their uh, biometric, or their second factor FIDO compliant security key to authenticate to your app. So this allows us to extend the ease of passwordless authentication to the web. Native apps on Android can access equivalent functionality by calling the FIDO2 APIs provided by Google Play services. OK, so another piece of good news is that as of last month, you can now, now use your Android phone as a, as a second factor security key to authenticate to your Google account. Now, second factor authentication is probably one of the most important things you can do to secure your online account. And not all second factor authentication methods um, provide the same security guarantees. And so um, this integration here hits a sweet spot in convenience and security. Today, it works for Google accounts. And we're working on standardizing the API so that we can standardizing the protocol so that we can bring it to other websites in the future. All right. So we've spent the last few minutes talking about user authentication online. We've also done a lot of work 
to make user authentication really easy in the real world. So I'd like to bring Renee on stage to tell us more about that. Thank you. Hey, Renee. My six-month-old son just turned, uh, just got his first driver's license. Um, unfortunately, his onesies, they don't have pockets. So he doesn't have a great way to uh, carry this plastic card around with him. So can we do something to help him out with that? Well, I would say six months may be a bit young to be driving or carrying a phone. But let's talk about that, because I think many of us have that same usability problem of having too many things to carry around. So I am, joking aside, I'm very happy to talk about a few details on exciting upcoming areas in Android security. The first is what we call identity credentials. And this is about electronic ID. Electronic ID has been an active topic in research and early projects for quite a while. And before coming to Google, I actually myself have worked for three years in that space. So please excuse me for being just a little bit excited about this topic, reaching a level of maturity that allows us to bring to end users right now. What I'm very happy to announce is that Android will support electronic identity in the form that we also call identification in the physical world. That may be the mobile driving licenses that we just see here. That might also be future travel documents or simple club membership cards. Now, in all of those use cases, Android support will focus on strong security and privacy guarantees. As is typical with Android, we are designing an open API to allow apps to use such new hardware and platform support. This new credential ident identity credential API will support the development of so-called holder apps. These holder apps are applications that support a specific form of electronic identity, like, for example, those mobile driving licenses. Those apps are free to define their own communication protocols to the verifier or reader apps, for example, through NFC or other wireless channels, as well as their communication to the respective issuing authority of that credential. Android implements a new credential store that can be accessed through this API and manages secure storage of all such provisioned credentials. Depending on hardware support, this will be backed by OEM-specific secure hardware with respective attestation, as you might know from Keymaster and Strongbox key attestation. Now, within that credential store, every app that provisions such credentials has its own private store of attributes belonging to this particular document. And the store will transparently handle their secure persistence and access control for apps that created those items. Users will, in addition, be able to view a transaction log of all accesses to their credential attributes to ensure transparency of those identity documents in pretty much the same way that the call log does that for incoming and outgoing calls. Now, unfortunately, some of the international standards, including the ISO working group for mobile driving licenses that Google is also contributing to, haven't locked down yet at this point to a sufficient extent that we were um, comfortable merging this API directly into the queue platform. However, in the very near future, we will be releasing a new Jetpack compatibility library that implements the credential store within an app's private data directory. This API is not expected to change significantly. So as soon as this library is released, all developers are free to start developing such electronic identity holder apps. The library will be compatible with the vast majority of Android devices out there in the field at the moment. In future versions, we expect a new HAL implementation for OEM-specific backends based on secure hardware that will be used by a credential store system service and made available through new framework APIs that will very, very closely match the APIs that we will soon release in that compatibility library. If the hardware supports it, and to me, that's one of the most exciting parts there, this will also allow what we call direct access. 
Direct access is using your identity credential, your document, even if the main phone battery is too low to power the, the CPU and therefore to boot Android. So just using, for example, an NFC tab to the reader, you will still be able to use that document even if the phone no longer boots. That, of course, requires some hardware support, but support for this is already in the HAL, in the draft HAL specifications, as well as the API that you will be able to start using. With that secure hardware support, devices can also give the highest and certifiable security and privacy guarantees for users as well as the issuing authorities. Now, to give a small sneak peek of what that API looks like, it's pretty simple, actually. An API would first create an instance of the credential store and use that reference to provision a new credential, a new document, as we also say, which can actually have multiple what we call namespaces in there. One namespace could, for example, be that draft standard of the ISO mobile driving license, but could also be extended within the same document with another namespace that could add additional attributes to make this document a real ID travel document for within the United States here. After creating, after provisioning such a new credential, an app can also request a proof, an attestation, that all those attributes were provisioned into the secure hardware exactly as provided by the issuing authority and send that proof back to the issuing authority for verification there. Now, I'd like to change tack a little and move on to the second upcoming topic that I am very pleased to talk about, which is how we mitigate against what we call insider attacks in the Android ecosystem. There are actually multiple efforts towards that goal, but here on this talk, I would like to primarily speak about firmware transparency on multiple layers. Now, if I speak about insiders, what do I actually mean by that? An insider is any person who has privileged access to information or resources. That is intentionally a very broad definition. It includes hardware and protocol designers, of course, software developers, but also logistics and retail shop personnel. In fact, many of you, most of you listening to this talk will be insiders in one way or the other. And that just includes access to your own app signing key. Now, with so much complexity, so many stakeholders in the supply chain contributing to what goes into making a modern mobile phone, modern mobile device, the big question is how can users actually trust their own device? Our answer to that is focusing on transparency on many layers, from hardware all the way up to the apps and the dynamic code those apps actually load. In addition to the app signing upgrade key feature that Xiaowen mentioned earlier in her talk, I would like to dive into two other of those layers. The first layer is the system layer, which contains the main operating system itself. Android has always been among the most transparent OS by being open source. In last year's Android Pi, we added end-to-end client-side encrypted backups to mitigate against insider attacks on such backups. And that even includes Google servers, Google server administrators in that threat model of being considered insiders. Now, we go one step further towards the transparency of the system by um, focusing on the software, on the system software that's running on the device itself. A new version of AVB tool can now be used to compute the top-level digest of the Android system image if the device is using the standard VB meta format for verified boot. For Pixel 3 and 3A phones, you can download the latest factory images and independently compute this digest. Now, with, when the device boots, the updated bootloader will verify this VB meta digest and all the associated partitions mentioned within this VB metadata and pass on the measured hash to Keymaster running in Trust Zone as well as Strongbox running on the Titan M chip. This is true for both Pixel 3 and Pixel 3a phones as of today. An app can create the private key in Keymaster or, or Strongbox, request an attestation certificate for those keys, and 
that certificate will now contain a new field with exactly this measured hash as seen early on in the boot chain by the bootloader itself before even passing control over to the Android kernel. Now, by matching that hash in the attestation certificate with the one computed independently and offline from the official factory images, it is certain that this device is actually running one of the official factory images that has passed all the checks, that has gone through all the testing, and not one that may have been modified for an individual or just a small group of devices. Coming at uh, the second layer I would like to point out here is the firmware that runs below the main operating system. So if a device is lost or stolen, how can we make sure that data is safe even when we assume insider attacks with access to firmware signing keys? That is where we add what we call insider attack resistance on the layers below the device. Let me quickly explain how that works. The first line of defense is that cryptographic keys are generated and stored in secure hardware like the Titan M chip. This is tied into verified boot and will only make those keys available, for example, for device level decryption, for the key that is used for FBE on device, when the proper user knowledge factor, that is pin code, password, or pattern, is entered by the user. However, an insider with access to such signing keys, leaked, whatever went wrong there, could potentially create a trojanized firmware that, when you update the Titan M or other secure element to that, would make those cryptographic keys available without performing that verification for the user knowledge factor. With Strongbox insider attack resistance, we take the next step of mitigating against such attacks. By default, every update to the Titan M firmware will invalidate all keys that are stored inside. Only when the user knowledge factor is available during the update itself will the keys be migrated to work on the new version of the firmware. Now, if an attacker has a correctly signed firmware update but doesn't have access to the user pin, password, or pattern, they can still force apply that update. To the bootloader, it looks like a legitimate update. It's correctly signed, it has an updated version counter, and so on. They can force that update to apply, but without having the, the user knowledge factor at the same time, this will make all keys inaccessible and therefore be roughly equivalent to a factory data reset. Coming back to the multiple different layers that I talked about, we have to conclude that every one of those layers will require different methods to mitigate insider attacks. However, transparency is a key component to all of them. We are trying hard to make it possible for developers and users to verify what is happening on every layer and to audit instead of having to trust all those parties in that complex supply chain. Whenever reasonably possible, we take ourselves out of the trust equation so that you don't actually have to take our word for it, but can verify yourself. As app developers, we recommend you do similar analysis of what insider attacks on any of the components that are under your direct control could look like and what you can do to mitigate against that. We are all in this together. And the open source nature of Android luckily makes it easier to build this kind of transparency. Now, thanks a lot for all your attention on what was a very dense session with a lot of detail. And special thanks to all of you coming in here in the morning after the big party. Highly appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.